Hey, welcome back to the channel. My name is Seem Lund and today we have another Instagram Q&A. If you want to ask me another question in the future or be featured in this uh, video, then yeah, head over to in my Instagram at Seem Lund and I do these uh, Q&As quite regularly there. This episode is brought to you by Bon Charge, formerly known as Blue Blocks. My favorite light and seat station companies, Blue Blocks, has rebranded themselves as Bon Charge. They're now involved with a huge range of evidence-based products to improve your wellness and life in every way. Their extensive range of premium wellness products helps you to sleep better, perform better, have more energy, recover faster, balance your hormones, and reduce inflammation. My favorites are their red light light bulbs because they can be used to create a melatonin-friendly environment in your bedroom by shining only red and not blue or green light waves that will reduce your sleep quality. After starting to use these red light light bulbs, I find it much easier to fall asleep and feel less awake before bed. If you want to try out these amazing products that are the cornerstones to my most optimal sleep, then head over to bondcharge.com forward slash seamlund and use the code seam15 to save 15%. Alright, question number one. Is Wagyu cattle diabetic? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you haven't uh, seen before, then uh, Wagyu beef is this very, like, super fatty uh, beef that has this intramuscular fat accumulation, essentially, like this, you know, a lot of fat in there, not a lot of protein, actually, so most of it is will be, you know, uh, actually fat calories. And, uh, you know, the reason why this uh, Wagyu beef, you know, bill or, you know, it, be it becomes as such isn't, you know, because of that they are somehow like uh, obese necessarily, but because of yeah, like this uh, insulin resistance that uh, accumulates this um, intramuscular fat eventually. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's not diabetic essentially. I mean, they probably they have like some diabetes. It's not uh, going to have like any like real harm on your health uh, directly. You know, eating a diabetic cow isn't going to make you a diabetic. Um, but it may, you know, it may like you make over consume calories because like I said, it's super fatty There's a ton of calories there. It has a lot more calories than let's say lean beef and uh, much less protein So in that sense, yeah, you know, you just get a lot of calories whether or not you should eat it You know depends on your you know calorie macros and uh, whether or not how many calories you have to consume But uh, inherently it's not going to make you diabetic unless you become obese and uh, diabetic in the process next question <coughs> creatine in capsule or powder so creatine, yeah, very good supplement. Um, I think that, or yeah, like you would want to actually consume creatine as a powder and mix it with water. That's where you get the most of the absorption. And uh, that's where you also get the hydration benefits of creatine. So that, you know, the uh, creatine helps to store water inside the muscles and uh, consuming it with water will have uh, like a more direct effect on that compared to uh, capsules for sure. The quickest way to recover after food poisoning um, well, I mean, depends on the degree or the severity or the type of that as well. If you have like a bacterial infection, which usually food poisoning is, then um, then in that sense, like fasting is one of the best ways to help with that. Fasting helps with bacterial infections quite easily. When you get sick, animals get sick, they stop eating. And uh, yeah, usually like eating food on top of a food poisoning uh, will just, you know, flare up <laughs> that uh, symptom again. You're going to get you know, more nausea and uh, more of these symptoms of food poisoning. By doing that so fasting is the best way to do that you just have to kind of wait it out a little bit uh, things that can help to speed it up would be you know activated charcoal to bind to that um, basically endotoxemia that um, gets created from this bacteria uh, things like NAC things like uh, vitamin C uh, different kinds of antioxidants can also help uh, with that thoughts on lemon water in the mornings uh, so uh, yeah I mean it's very popular a lot of people do it I think it's great, like in some sense, it's, uh, I mean, it's gonna help about balance your blood sugar levels as well, help to like lower the cortisol a little bit, uh, and uh, yeah, kind of wakes up some of the uh, digestive enzymes. It's not, yeah, like super inherently needed. I think like salted water is also very good for the gut and uh, the cortisol levels, but lemon water is kind of one uh, option. Do, do, do. <clears throat> Why not sauna before sleep? So yeah, it may like elevate your body temperature and the heart rate which can keep you up and uh, prevent you from falling asleep. So ideally, like same with the exercise, you want to wait at least, you know, a few hours, four hours, five hours at least uh, before bed. Supplements for healthy brain function. So, uh, you know, obviously good quality nutrition is the foundation to that foods that have a positive effect on the brain. I think the most important one is choline, and you get that from egg yolks and liver, the big two biggest sources of choline 
then different kinds of uh, dark cruciferous vegetables for the polyphenols as well as the methyl donors you get from that they have protective effects on the brain obviously your brain is made out of um, a lot of uh, fat and the cholesterol so again egg yolks but specifically these um, you know omega-3 fatty acids DHA EPA you get from fatty fish uh, those are also kind of the main building blocks of the brain and uh, I think olive oil is a good one it has polyphenols antioxidants and um, the oleic acid has also been found to have a lot of benefits for brain and uh, protecting against neurodegeneration right why are glycine good to take <laughs> so why is glycine good to take uh, I think yeah glycine is one of my favorite supplements it uh, has multiple benefits one of the main benefits is that it's part of collagen so it helps with skin tendons ligaments those kind of things but it also uh, has antioxidant properties it helps to lower uh, blood sugar levels it helps to lower blood, uh, body temperature it lowers inflammation and it's part of glutathione or helps to boost glutathione so yeah i mean it's one of the most safest one of the most like you know effective uh, very easy to take and it uh, tastes sweet so you can add it to like you know coffee or just take it before bed to help with sleep and relaxation have you ever played a team sport? <laughs> uh, not really. Uh, I've never, you know, played any professional sport or anything like that. And the only like sport thing I've done, uh, I did like a few bodybuilding shows, um, fitness shows. But uh, yeah, like in a childhood, I used to play more, like you know, I don't know, soccer or basketball. But um, not that much nowadays. Uh, mostly, uh, yeah, different kinds of uh, fitness-related activities. Um, Best five things to prioritize to lose 35 pounds as quickly as possible and sustain it. So best five things would be to, you know, obviously you need to be in a calorie deficit and uh, the way to achieve that would be to eat uh, satiating and filling foods that have low calorie content like lean proteins and the vegetables. That's kind of the best food for rapid and sustainable weight loss. Uh, then secondly, you all do, you know, resistance training to build lean muscle tissue and make you very insulin sensitive that's gonna just improve your metabolism to the extent that losing weight becomes very easy and you have a high resting metabolic rate so you don't even have to like exercise all the time to uh, keep keep the weight off third would be to you know manage your stress and sleep well because then by default you will you know make better decisions and you will have less you know, stress that would uh, <laughs> make you want to overeat essentially Number four would be to kind of have some sort of um, like another purpose, but yeah, like some things to do <laughs> other than eating, because a lot of times people eat because they're bored um, and uh, things to do include like work related things, some, some things you're passionate about, hobbies other than food. And obviously relationships can be an important part of that as well. Food is, um, you know, a social activity, but I mean, a lot of people eat out of loneliness or they eat just because they're bored, like I said. And lastly, I would say maybe, I don't know, like cardio or uh, walking. I think that's also very underrated in an, uh, just actually, many people just don't do, do, they don't do cardio. So if you incorporate it into your weekly routine, then yeah, it's just gonna make it um, much easier to keep the weight off. How many days of the week do you not do keto? So um, I think I may do keto or I mean, I'm never actually like on a very strict or an actual keto ketogenic diet. Like um, I have days where I eat low carb and days where I just uh, eat specifically like higher fat foods. But um, the vast majority of the days I'm still, you know, eating too many carbs to be in ketosis. I mean, it's fine for me. And um, I still, I think, produce substantial amounts of ketones um, in my fasted window. Like right now, I haven't eaten anything uh, for today and I've fasted for maybe... Uh, 16 or 17 hours and uh, yeah because of the extended fasting window on a daily basis uh, I do get adequate amounts of ketone production as well how many days of the week do I not do keto then I mean I'm in ketosis almost every day <laughs> but uh, yeah like in the evenings I still eat carbs on most of the days so maybe I have two low carb days per week usually on like rest days du -du -du. alkaline water is it good so alkaline water, I don't think that it's good for, as a default. I don't think that it's something that you just want to drink as a default. Because, you know, alkali, you, you want to have like a acidic stomach. And if you drink a lot of alkaline water, then that can cause like, you know, indigestion and 
digestion issues. So as a default, you still want to consume, you know, preferably mineral water, but you know, regular water is uh, fine, unless you have like some metabolic acidosis or some super, you know, muscle soreness, <clears throat> whatever inflammatory conditions. Then maybe like a, a little bit of alkaline water can be beneficial, but uh, as a default, um, I don't think that it's inherently good. Does adding a little bit of glycine to my coffee in the morning break my fast? <laughs> so, uh, you know, glycine, it doesn't have calories, it lowers blood sugar, uh, but it does raise insulin, which is the mechanism by which it lowers blood sugar. Uh, so I don't think that it, you know, matters. I don't think it matters that much. Um, but uh, if you were to want to be super kind of uh, OCD about it, then yeah, <laughs> you may want to not add it to your morning coffee, but I personally don't think that it matters at that point. Because coffee can also balance, you know, coffee activates the AMPK, which is like the opposite of insulin and um, helps you to boost the benefits of fasting. So, you know, it's a, you know, balancing act. I don't think that it, a small amount of glycine actually has any substantial effect on the fasting uh, state. <clears throat> Adding 35% cream to my coffee in the morning, is it breaking my fast? So 35% cream depends on the amount if it's only like 100 calories like a tablespoon then I don't think so it's um, not enough and it's mostly fat the milk protein I mean cream also has a little bit of sugar the milk protein may like also spike insulin but again I don't think that it matters in that quantities if you have like a thousand calories of cream then yeah probably <laughs> it's gonna do that do, do, do. what do you think about incline bed therapy so the incline bed therapy is where you have your head like, or you basically yeah, the head of your bed is elevated by like 10 or 15 centimeters and theoretically it's supposed to help with circulation uh, while you're sleeping so I think it I mean I haven't tried it myself um, I like I have a like I, I like to have like a big pillow <laughs> anyway I think it could be beneficial yeah for sure if, even if you're like maybe snoring that can be a useful trick to uh, you know prevent your neck from collapsing <laughs> So yeah, you can definitely try it. Uh, many people say that it works great. Um, I haven't seen any like substantial studies or anything to show that it has like some um, superior advantage over regular sleeping. Any tips for nerve pain, damage and regeneration? <clears throat> so for that, infrared light is beneficial. There, you know, obviously, um, actually one recent study found that innovative fasting helped with axon nerve regeneration through modulating the gut microbiome. Um, so I think that can be actually a good thing for that. From the food side, then yeah, you just want to promote, uh, consume foods that promote growth, obviously protein and uh, collagen can be added there. Uh, from the supplemental side, I think, yeah, one of the only supplements that comes to mind is like BPC-157, uh, which isn't like a supplement, it's a peptide. Uh, and that has a lot of like at least animal studies showing that it helps with many aspects of you know, regeneration many aspects of uh, recovery like yeah nerve cells and um, yeah things like uh, that pain joint pain those kind of things uh, the brand you know usually have to like inject it with a needle uh, but uh, the, there's only one brand that has like an oral BBC 157 which is by bioprime supplements and yeah just you know a tincture you put it into your mouth and uh, consume it that way. The they also have a regeneration serum that uh, is like a um, ointment or some, some you know that you uh, put it on your skin. But uh, yeah, like the PPC one fifty seven is the only one orally that I think could as a supplement, you know, or let's say like a peptide, healing peptide to help with nerve pain and uh, regeneration. And uh, yeah, the website, if I'm not mistaken, is Bio Prime Supplements, and the code for that is Scene Ten. Uh, for a 10% uh, discount if you're interested. I've tried it. I think that it has some uh, benefits for sure um, Iron deficient despite eating meat. So uh, yeah, iron deficiency Is very one of the most common nutrient deficiencies in the world primarily affecting females because of their uh, menstrual cycle, but uh, Yeah, even if you are eating a lot of meat and I mean iron is everywhere in our food supply. It's in cereals grains meat and uh, many other foods have iron already but iron deficiency is still one of the most common deficiencies and uh, the main reason for that in my opinion is because of um, the uh, lack of copper so copper helps with iron absorption copper helps with 
uh, hemoglobin production and uh, converting iron into hemoglobin so you need copper to basically do what iron needs to do and you get copper from you know liver and uh, dark chocolate and beans uh, things like that so look into that probably that's the reason why you may also have like some genetic let's say genetic uh, factors that reduce your iron absorption or hemoglobin production so yeah you need to maybe do a dna test to assess that but regardless like just eat red meat plus um, plus uh, the uh, liver as well as oysters seafood maybe uh, like dark chocolate as well <clears throat> is salt necessary well um, sodium as well as chloride mm, i mean they are you know essential nutrients your body needs salt to do many things pretty much everything uh, energy production digestion and uh, yeah like salt you know I don't think that you need to have let's say or you would survive without ever consuming salt as a you know from a shaker or whatever uh, but let's say if you don't get enough salt from your food either then that can cause uh, problems so you know ancestrally you would get salt from water from like some springs or mineral waters uh, some rivers whatever you get salt from there um, and you also get salt from a lot of foods obviously seafood is very salty by default uh, sea vegetables fish uh, oysters uh, clams uh, but also like, you know, if you kill an animal, you drink the blood, you eat the bones, those have, you know, salt in it th as well. And a lot of the studies that looked at the, uh, the hunter-gatherer salt consumption, they didn't, uh, you know, take that into account. So um, hunter-gatherers, even if they're not like necessarily didn't have salt shakers, <laughs> they still consumed uh, quite a lot of salt from the animals they ate. And uh, yeah, salt is, you know, depends on the diet, you know, if you have like a high carb diet, a lot of fruit, etc., then chances are your salt requirements are much lower because of the kind of um, increased potassium intake as well as the uh, aspect of insulin making you hold onto water better. But let's say on a low carb diet, you definitely, you know, if you're not directly eating a lot of seafood or you're not that directly eating a lot of fermented foods, for example, or, you know, drinking blood that has salt in it, then uh, yeah you may just need to add like a little bit of salt to your diet if you're eating the standard western diet processed food diet that uh, has added salt in everything then i don't think that you need extra salt for sure depends on the diet that you follow uh, but uh, as a mineral let's say salt is uh, essential for sure <clears throat> uh, do, do, do. do i lose a lot of benefits of 16 and 8 if i do it only five di five days a week well, I mean, <laughs> depends on yeah, like what kind of benefits. Uh, and I mean, if you do even do it once, uh, once a week, you're still getting some benefits in that day of doing that. And obviously, it depends on the overall calorie consumption of the rest of the week. So yeah, I don't think that um, it matters how often you do it; you still get benefits while doing it for sure. Which weightlifting targets the whole body the most? So the main compound lifts like you know barbell squats, uh, deadlifts, barbell rows, bench press, overhead press, standing overhead press, um, those will be the main uh, exercises that target pretty much the entire body on all those lifts. So even if you are like you know bench pressing with proper form, you actually have to like you know, embrace your core and legs a little bit as well. With the deadlift, you're using your entire body. With the squat, I mean you're you know using your legs primarily, but you know you have to also have like a uh, tight back and uh, core muscles so uh, yeah those are the main barbell compound lifts that uh, target the body and the benefit of these uh, full body compound lifts is that studies do find that they uh, trigger a bigger hormonal response like more IG1 more testosterone um, and uh, things like that and actually yeah, free weights generally outperform uh, like machines as well in muscle growth and uh, muscle uh, strength all right, next question. What's the best time to sleep? So, um, best time to sleep but from a circadian rhythm standpoint is generally like before midnight for humans. I mean, yeah, there's people who have uh, more nocturnal habits, but uh, these uh, habits or being uh, like a morning owl, morning uh, lark or a night owl, they're primarily caused by lifestyle. So naturally, humans are supposed to be diurnal that we generally sleep at night and we stay awake at daytime and yeah some people are more like they exhibit more morningness or more eveningness which means that yeah they may go to bed a bit a few hours later or a few hours earlier uh, but yeah generally around like before midnight i think you should be definitely in bed 
and uh, that also kind of coincides with the natural production of hormones that the human body goes through so uh, uh, the human body starts to produce natural melatonin around like 9 p.m. slowly and uh, reaches its peak at 11 p.m. when you start to produce uh, growth hormone as well that's the most growth hormone you produce during the daytime and uh, yeah like in the morning your cortisol starts to rise around 6 a.m. peaks at uh, 9 a.m. so that's the human natural circadian rhythm so I think that uh, going to bed around like 9 to 11 p.m. is uh, good for most people and waking up around you know 6 to 8 a.m. somewhere between there of course there are you know shift work and literal night owls <laughs> who do the opposite but uh, yeah I mean they still get some of these uh, surges in growth hormones because the human body can adapt but I think if you also want to link yourself to the day and night cycles then uh, yeah that's the optimal uh, window to aim for because you know there's no point in being awake in nature if you're a human uh, if there if the if it's dark outside because you can't hunt you can't do anything <laughs> uh, you can only sit at a bonfire so yeah whereas in the morning you can go hunt etc so the human body is geared and uh, kind of evolved to be this uh, diurnal which means that wake up in the morning with the sunrise technically and go to bed when it's uh, dark pretty much um, which doesn't mean that you can't stay up if it's dark of course but uh, you have to kind of still respect the natural human um, diurnal cycles and kind of you know block out the blue light and uh, use whatever technologies you can to still mimic that natural cycle as much as possible do -do -do. glutathan supplementation for reversing grays after massive stressors so uh, Glutathione um, is more of like a you know antioxidant, and it's more of like a protective antioxidant. It's it's better as a, like a preventive thing. Uh, I don't think that it can directly like reverse gray hair, um, but for for that you know you can still promote growth of hair with you know collagen. I think uh, you know protein intake and collagen those are the biggest determinants of you know hair growth and hair regeneration. Um, so I think that's kind of the main focus that should be of, again like the BBC 157 could help with that astaxanthin, vitamin C, vitamin E, maybe glycine you can add a whole lot of like other supplements that you could take for other reasons besides the hair uh, but um, yeah the collagen and um, protein intake probably is the main main focus so like you double your collagen intake maybe and uh, red light therapy actually can also help uh, directly with that to uh, do, do, do next question important to take creatine with water for best absorption or can take a scoop on the tongue yeah so yeah you need to take or the best absorption you get from um, creatine if you take it with water so you hydrate better things that can help to heal uh, injured ligaments um, for that the you know slow controlled and the full range of motion uh, is the best kind of <laughs> uh, medicine for uh, the joints so you still need to move the joints a little bit like if you have a broken arm you put it into a cast you're not moving the arm and when you remove the cast you know, and you can see that people's uh, muscles have withered away <laughs> and their arm is like uh, half as size as it was before and the reason for that is because of like immobility not necessarily because of the brokenness of the bone but immobility is what is you know causing the withering of the muscles and uh, movement helps with the recovery a lot so you need to still you know if you have like an injury obviously you, do, you don't want to exacerbate the injury you don't want to make it painful but you do want to like move it to a certain extent and uh, I made a video about uh, doing like this slow I had some uh, pain in my um, elbows like many years ago five six years ago and the reason I overcame it with was uh, doing these very slow push-ups um, to like basically direct more blood flow into this elbow region and uh, because these tendons they don't have many blood vessels they recover very slowly so you need to basically go out of your own way to uh, extra work for those regions directly to direct blood flow into there and yeah different kinds of push-ups to target those regions very slowly controlled and full range of motion uh, you don't want to you know exhaust the muscles you just want to promote blood flow into there and you can also have pl planks uh, one you know actual biohack for uh, the injuries is to use the katsu bands so katsu blood flow restriction bands have been used 
in many studies actually to uh, help with uh, joint recovery and even like helps to maintain muscle if you have broken an arm so yeah like if you have a um, your arm is in a cast you put the cartel bands on and the cartel bands work even without you doing anything like they have this um, setting where they start to uh, uh, put, like increase the pressure in the cuffs so it increases the pressure releases it so it creates this pumping effect like pressure on pressure off and this by itself will uh, help to you know move blood in the limb and um, even without lifting anything you have people have seen uh, accelerated recovery and more muscle maintenance uh, muscle preservation after an injury by using that so the cartel bands are amazing for yeah like just lifting lighter weights and getting a lot more blood flow into those regions without causing additional injury so definitely look at look, uh, suggest looking into that from a supplemental side again bpc 157 is great for that uh, collagen um, and um, you know probably like yeah red light infrared light will also help with that those are the kind of main ones that come to mind but yeah exercise and blood flow is the best uh, medicine for that how many workouts per week do you do? Uh, well, I work out pretty much every day to, in some degree, so it's not always like some intense stuff. It's some days I'm just, you know, mobility, that's I also consider like movement, but it's not gonna like elevate my heart rate significantly. On average, I work out like three to four times with uh, resistance training, which includes either weights or calisthenics, so the kind of strength-based movements. On usually two days I'll do cardio which is just uh, zone 2 type cycling or uh, jogging and uh, maybe one day is a quote-unquote rest day where I go for a longer walk or do like some mobility yoga that kind of thing du -du -du. how to build strength and endurance quickly not necessarily muscles well for strength it's very easy you <laughs> it's not easy uh, sorry for the endurance it's quite easy like you have to do a lot of zone 2 cardio and uh, the way or the biggest mistake people do with endurance training is that uh, they train endurance as if they're going for like a hit cardio or sprint <laughs> so if you're doing the hit and sprinting then you're getting better at hitting and sprinting sprinting not necessarily the zone 2 cardio so if you want to get better at zone 2 cardio which is the kind of uh, aerobic capacity then um, you have to do the zone 2 cardio and uh, do the cardio while maintaining this aerobic um, engine and for that you have to be for most people it's uh, below the 65 percent of your vr2 uh, max threshold if you're fat adapted then that can be higher you can even be like 85 if you're super keto but generally yeah like you want to stay in the fat burning state which means being yeah usually maintaining nasal breathing is a good indicator of that so you want to just get better at that and go as fast as you can while still breathing through your nose that's how you build endurance over time and yeah as you get better then you can run faster while still maintaining this um, aerobic state and burn fat in it for strength strength uh, is actually kind of a similar approach you don't want to you know go to failure when you're training for strength and power for strength and power you want to yeah go for the highest intensity uh, while still being able to recover from it and uh, and uh, yeah like going for like um, somewhere between three reps maybe three to three reps three to five reps is the kind of the I think sweet spot for strength and um, yeah the intensities for that are usually like you know 80 to 90 percent of your one repetition maximum so it has to be super intense uh, or near your um, one repetition maximum to build strength um, but the kind of uh, volume tends to be uh, lower so you don't need to do a lot of uh, volume and you don't need to go to failure to build strength for strength you need to kind of reach <laughs> the uh, near maximum but you don't want to you know completely burn yourself out by doing that <clears throat> are there ways to decrease shbg uh, shbg uh, sex hormone binding globulin so uh, sex hormone binding globulin can like decrease your testosterone levels or free testosterone levels you combine to it uh, so um, things for that I think best for that is a boron many people don't uh, use it so boron three milligrams a day is very good to reduce that which will help to increase testosterone uh, as well as estrogen for females uh, then you want to also make sure that you're not in a calorie deficit so calorie deficit and being in a, like a starvation state <laughs> low thyroid will raise SHBG 
SHP levels. Uh, high protein intake helps to lower SHPG and um, you know carbs as well actually help to lower that because carbs are very like energy stimulating or they uh, signal high energy like raising insulin and eating carbs tells your body that okay, you're not starving and uh, that's a one way to also decrease SHPG levels. Du -du -du. Best ways to remove heavy metals from the body only one heavy metal in my playlist. <laughs> yes, uh, only have your heavy metals in your playlist, uh, not your body. So best ways to do that would be saunas, exercise, um, I mean calorie restriction, fasting, because you're you know burning fat. That can do that, but it's problematic if you mobilize the toxins and metals into your bloodstream. So you need binders for that, like active charcoal, spirulina. But uh, yeah, to extra excrete them, then uh, sweat. So saunas are the best one. Infrared saunas actually have been used. So combining a niacin plus infrared saunas is a good way to uh, do that on a regular basis. You also excrete like uh, these um, plastics and pesticides. <clears throat> if we're going to be sedentary doing work, uh, is it better to do PSMF or a protein sparing modified fast or OMAD or one meal a day? Um, yeah, it depends on, again, your individual preference. I think they're both very equal in terms of the metabolic outcome. Um, PSMF is probably more suitable if you're like trying to build muscle or if you're super frail and you need to maintain muscle because you get to consume protein. Um, but OMAD, maybe some people prefer OMAD if uh, they don't like to eat at work. So I think they're both kind of equal in terms of the metabolic output. Both will increase your insulin sensitivity and both will you know, prevent these blood sugar ups and downs that you may get if you're eating like a standard diet at work. <clears throat> What's your thoughts about cannabis and using it to stress relief? Um, well, I'm not using cannabis. Uh, I don't think that it's, <laughs> I don't think that's a good way to relieve stress. I think there's much better ways to do it. And uh, yeah, I don't think that's kind of uh, necessary in my opinion. I mean, maybe someone else may disagree, but yeah, in my personal opinion, yeah, I've never kind of used it and uh, don't plan to use it either. Um, do, do, do. Just got York intolerance test back. Only egg yolk came back borderline. I eat eggs most day. So that's the thing with the most of these uh, food intolerance tests is that, uh, you know, if you get a red flag on a test, okay, milk or egg, whatever, then uh, it can be because of you're actually consuming them. So your body, you know, has antibodies or produces antibodies in response to consuming those uh, foods. And uh, you know, that's the reason why it flares up. You know, you have to look at the actual symptoms. Do you get like, you know, some skin inflammation or gut issues uh, from eating those foods or not? If you don't get any symptoms, then you really don't have to anything to worry about. Uh, so I don't think that it's, you know, it's not uh, needed to, let's say, avoid eggs if you don't get any symptoms from them, even if your test says that you're intolerant. So yeah, look at the symptoms uh, first, I think. What can help with muscle cramps on a carnivore diet? So salt, probably, probably most importantly, magnesium and potassium. So, you know, on a carnivore diet, you don't get that much potassium. So that's probably the biggest reason uh, why it may occur. So um, <laughs> I would suggest that looking into maybe adding some fruit or uh, things like that into your diet, uh, mineral waters or all the electrolytes and maybe like a magnesium supplement. Does supplementing melatonin suppress or disrupt dopamine? Not that I know of. Uh, like high melatonin levels have been associated with depression and like mood disorders because maybe you're so like tired and drowsy from the melatonin levels. Um, I don't think that the melatonin supplement would uh, help with that. And um, I don't think that uh, melatonin has like any effect on dopamine per se. Do you use SPF on your face most days? Uh, no. Well, I'm, I don't need to <laughs> because I'm not that. I don't get that much sun here in Estonia, especially now that the fall and winter is coming. Uh, in the summer, I didn't use it either because, I mean, it wasn't that like intense, I think, uh, here in Estonia. I did use a little bit of uh, SPF when I was in uh, Sicily for my honeymoon and especially when we like climbed Mount Etna, which is, you know, 
2,000 meters above sea level. So there, it makes sense to actually use some uh, sun protection, I think, especially if you're not uh, local and you're not uh, used to it. So in those kind of situations, I think it's uh, worth it, but uh, not on a daily basis if you're not really uh, getting that much uh, sunlight exposure. Uh, funny thing enough, you know, I was in the Sicily and the locals themselves, you know, who don't, I don't, I don't think that they use SPF or any sunscreen, they did have like um, a lot of these, you know, pigment sunspots and those kind of things. Um, so I think that, you know, even if you're like a local living in a very warmer country with a lot of more sunlight, then it's still worthwhile and smart to use some sunscreen or SPF. Uh, because, yeah, it, it just, you know, goes to show that, yeah, like the, <laughs> those locals even who uh, live there, they did have a lot more like uh, skin damage or um, wrinkles from the sunlight exposure, I think. Um, to, to do a best supplement for best skin, <laughs> uh, collagen probably, protein, whey protein, uh, unless you're allergic, glycine, those kind of things. Do electrolytes or EAAs break a fast, 10 calories per scoop? Um, I don't think so, it's a very small amount. Do, do, do. How to reverse macular degeneration? So uh, the biggest reason for that usually has to do with like screen time, if you're a lot of, you know, artificial blue light is going to damage the retinas and to damage the eyes so if you are working in front of a computer then definitely use some sort of filters or these um, glasses see-through lenses blue blocking glasses like the one in Borden charge for example that you know they don't filter out the colors you can see, see everything but they filter out the blue intense spike that and they protect your eyes uh, obviously you also need to do like eye yoga exercises you know massage your eyeballs look into the distance a lot of like myopia that you get from this uh, screen time can also be reversed by just looking out of the window, looking at long distances. Like most of our lives is just 10 centimeters away nowadays. <laughs> we look at only things 10, 10 centimeters away. We don't look at things uh, 100 meters away that much, which is a problem for the eye health, I think. Um, supplements, vitamin E, astaxanthin, maybe, maybe like uh, glutathione. Uh, but uh, yeah, avoiding oxidative stress <coughs> and uh, red light is probably another one that can be used. Du -du -du. Question, next question. Um, what can I do to function on six to seven hours of sleep instead of eight? <laughs> so, uh, I mean, you need to make sure that the sleep is quality and um, get enough deep sleep and REM sleep. So, you know, blocking blue light before enables you to fall asleep faster and enables you to go through the sleep stages uh, better as well. So you get more of the uh, quality sleep stages um, in a cool environment, people sleep better. So um, lowering the temperature of your room and the bed is good. Uh, taking glycine will uh, lower your blood temperature and uh, relaxes you. So it's very beneficial as a sleep supplement. Even magnesium can be uh, done for that. Uh, meditation has been found to uh, reduce the demand for sleep <coughs> and meditators function better on less sleep so some sort of mindfulness practice exercise uh, increases your sleep demand so you just you know fall asleep faster uh, and uh, I think that uh, although like exercise increases your sleep demand you can get away with less sleep if you exercise because your body is kind of getting this uh, small hormetic stress from the exercise that increases your overall stress uh, resilience and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, you can also try like a siesta, take a siesta, like a nap in the afternoon. Now that is, I think, uh, you know, if you sleep six hours in your core sleep uh, at night and then you have like a 30 minute nap in the afternoon, then that kind of catches up uh, on that uh, sleep deprivation short one. So yeah, like a nap is a good way to kind of uh, cycle or dissect your daily sleep um, time into like a sm smaller chunk a little bit. All right, that's it for this Q&A. If you want to ask me another question in the future, then yeah, make sure you follow me on Instagram and I do those Q&As uh, quite regularly there, at Seamlund. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you click a like, subscribe, notification bell as well. My name is Seam. Stay optimized, stay empowered.